right, for maybe another 30 years. So you have to have, you have to have a, a you have to be stubborn. And if Indians weren't stubborn, we wouldn't be here at all. But we are. We're, we're stubborn people, sometimes to our own detriment and sometimes to the only thing that holds us together. Independent. We're independent. And um, again, good and bad. However, or by and large, I think uh, it's, it's our independence that people value as well. And of course, we know who we are. So now, what's going to happen next? Well, when you think back over those years, of all those dedicated people, and some have been killed outright, and they returned home. Guatemalan people I know were killed. People from Mapuches from Chile were killed. People from the Amazon were killed when they went home. You know, it's costly. But the leaders went, knowing full well that was a penalty. That's what goes on in this world. Much of you don't know that because you're not involved. Your identity was settled. 1776, and you're pretty much who you are, Americans. We've had to struggle from that time on. Treaties. Treaties are law of nations. And that's been our, our challenge. We've had treaties. Treaties are international instruments uh, a lot of rules to treaties. And one of them is that all treaties must be judged according to the times that they were made. You can't apply present day times to a treaty that was made in 1779 or 1794. You had to apply it to the times that it was made and what were the conditions of the times, and that's what prevails. 1774, here in the United, uh, it was in the United States then. Colonies, 13 colonies, 1774. People fighting against each other, and the Haudenosaunee, much the backbone of uh, politics in the whole East Coast. Nothing went on very, very far if our leaders were not there. And the issue was always land. Land is the issue, will always be the issue. Land and the jurisdiction on it, still the issue today. That's what treaties are about. Most of the treaties in the United States, the 375 ratified treaties by the Congress the Senate of the United States, which means ratified, agreed upon, documents of force, uh, all been broken, every single one of them. And the strongest treaties for, I think, American Indians today is the one that Houdini holds in 1794 Canandaigua Treaty, the one that George Washington signed. Now, if George Washington signed a treaty, I would imagine they should keep it. I would imagine that the, you know, the integrity of the country would say, we should keep it. In the times, he needed that treaty in 17, 1794. He needed that treaty, you needed that treaty, 1790, 1789. Because the United States was uh, a loose union who had lost their uh, support from England, struggling for survival, powerful entities, Spain, France, now England. Nothing secure about the United States at all. 
needed that treaty. Today, don't pay much attention to it, but you should. It's a legal document, an international force. There's a lot of things that the American people don't know about their own history because they're just not told. As a professor of American history, I can tell you that. I know because I get people coming to my classes all the time that I have to instruct almost from the beginning. They have no idea of the history of our people in this country. All kinds of uh, conjectures about how many people were here at the landfall of Christopher Columbus, and I would say generally 16 million is agreed upon. Some will say 8 million, some will say 10, some will say 20, some will say eh, 16 million at least at the landfall of Christopher Columbus and in the year 1900, a little over 100 years ago, there were 250,000 Indians left in the United States. So what happened to all those people? That's a hard history. That's why you don't know much about it. That's a hard history to hear. Where'd they go? Well, they went the same place that 70 million buffaloes went. That's a hard history. Or several billion passenger pigeons, they've gone too. Yeah. I say American Indians have had a hard time. We've seen a lot, and we're still here, and we're still friendly, if you can imagine that. <laughs> Today, you know, uh, we need each other. We need each other. We have, we have, you know, I like that sign up there, it says, our common future. Boy, I'll tell you, it is common future now. I just came back from Greenland. I saw the ice. I saw the major ice cap. It's melting. People are concerned. And you're just not prepared for, for what you see. First, the enormity of the ice cap itself. That'll give you a little reference as to who you are when you stand there looking north. Two miles of ice deep, far as you can see. Powerful primal, absolute, an authority, nothing you're going to talk to, nothing, and the water running. What they said was that for the first time in the memory of any Greenlander, last year the water ran for the full 365 days of the year. Even though the temperatures were 50 below zero, the water was still running. The glaciers are moving back and moving forward. The water is running underneath the ice, it makes it slippery. And so it's moving towards the sea. At the same time, the heat is moving towards the ice. And so you have this place where they meet together and melt. Last year, we were told by the guide who had taken us to the ice cap, we were standing on this very kind of a high precipice. We had gone up, 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 up. And he said, last year, right where your foot is, he said, you took a step and you were on the ice. And now we look down, the ice was about 20 feet away and down about 20 feet. That's how much went down in one year. They're worried. The water is the color of cement. It's as thick as cement from the sediment. The power of these glaciers crush mountains into dust. Granite mountains crushed into dust by this great authority. 
and now it's running. So you see this really terrible color water that nothing can live in moving out to the fjords and then out into the Atlantic. Accelerating. So I'd be concerned. I'd be concerned. And I am concerned. And we all should be concerned. We'll know more about that. Uh, the traditional circle of Indian elders and youth are, are, are been asked by the uh, Inuit people to bring a fire back. They said the, our fire, our, our spiritual fire was extinguished by the last ice age. And we've always talked about when it was coming back. So there's a request. And I think the next meeting that we'll be having in Montana in June, hosted by the Assiniboine, I think uh, the Greenland leaders will be there making an official request for us to come and bring that fire in 08. And of course, I'm sure we'll do our best. Now that's a long ways and it's very costly. What I saw in the airplane going up there, big, there's only one, there's only one airport that can handle the Airbus. And um, what I saw in there was tough people. Only tough people go up there. And there were tourists there, but they, you know, you could tell who they were, but mostly these were working people. These were strong people, you could see. That's a, a hard place to live. I learned a lot. I saw the drinking on Saturday night really bad. Reminded me of a long while ago. They've got a long ways to go. They need our help. And I think we'll, we'll work. We'll be the guest of, of the country, the home green, Greenland's homeland. They're the ones that invited us and also I think Denmark, which is their protectorate. So it'll, it'll be at a very high level. It is, it's amazing beauty up there as well. Amazing, amazing beauty. As I said before, it's primal. So we have to keep track of that. In this particular trip, uh, ran into Al Gore <laughs> in Stockholm. He was, uh, Stockholm was premiering the movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And I know, I know Al from a while back. We worked together in 1990 in the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders for Human Survival at a major meeting in Moscow that was hosted by uh, President Gorbachev. And we were on the same committee. And he was talking about the same thing he's talking to today. It's not new. He must have been silenced by the Clinton administration. That's all I can say. But now he's not silenced now. So I urge all of you to see the movie. How many have seen the movie so far? Oh, that's good, but a whole lot more better see it. It's probably one of the good news that's up, out right now because it's so instructive. It's so well done. And he's coming on the 14th, is that correct? Yeah, I told him, I said, hey, you're coming to my country on the 14th. <laughs> he said, really? I said, yeah. So I think we'll get a little chance to sit down. There was no chance over there, not in one of those events. And the, the king and queen of Sweden were, were there. And they were talking, and, and I know the king, you know, over a period of time, and he saw Bo Ekman and myself standing in a crowd, and he called me over, he said, come on. So uh, he introduced me to, to El. <laughs> El says, I know him. 
And I think he was trying to figure out what I was doing there. I was so far out of context. Anybody, any president, whoever it is that, that wins the next presidential election has such a job of correcting the mess that's going on now. I don't know how they're going to do it. I mean, it's, it's really, I don't know, I know it's not going to be, it's not going to be taken care of just like that. So I can well imagine that he'd be thinking that one over. Nevertheless, the world needs a leader. The world needs leaders now. And I, you know, and if, if, if there's no leaders, then raise your own leaders. You know, that's, that's what you do. Put your leaders up. Change, change. Defend yourself. You know, the rest of the world thinks America's crazy. They really do. They, they say, what is the matter with you people? It's amazing. And from over there, yeah, they look pretty crazy over here. I don't know. Um, how things are going to turn out. It's awful hard to tell. But we ourselves, as, as individuals, have to, have to educate ourselves better. We have to exchange, got to talk more, and have to be more assertive about the direction of your life, your lives. And uh, the issue of seven generations is serious, really serious now. I mean, with all this wars and with everything else, that, that ice is melting. And the, the natural world authority is going to take over. And if you want to talk about economies going down, that'll go down. I mean, just uh, the one event with Katrina, still suffering from that. Still haven't been able to build up from that. And. Um, another season here. That's only going to accelerate. So we have to uh, be proactive these days. You know, take some instruction from Andy. He's been out there a long time saying all this stuff. Everybody's got to pick this up now. Remember old chief, you know, talking to the kids some kids ever did something bad, you know, sitting on the bench in front of us, and he was instructing him. He said, well, what'd you do that for? Well, he did it. I followed him. And he said to them, he said, be your own leader. Real good advice. Be your own leader. Make up your own mind. My, that instruction stuck with me. And so uh, I think as we, we try to understand what the problems are facing uh, indigenous people, facing Onondaga, facing you know, Onondaga Lake, uh, the opportunities that we have for cleaning the lake is here. And I want to thank everybody for being so supportive in that direction, because that's positive action. Everybody's going to benefit by cleaning that lake. Everybody. We have to work together on that and appreciate the support that's coming in that direction. It is the environment. And it is a common future. You know, with all of this business, we talk about the, you know, how did it get this way? How did come treaties aren't aren't honored? How come Indians lost all the land? How come Indians removed? How come all of that history? And it comes uh, down to the doctrine of discovery. Some years back, around 1991, I think uh, this kid comes walking into the elders' meeting out there in Tulalip, and he's got papers under his arms. And, 
young man, Delaware. He says, um, I'm a Delaware, and I have some information. I think somebody's got to know. And he talked about the doctrine of discovery, and we, we didn't know that. And he explained how way back the Pope issued a papal bull edict declaring that indigenous people did not have a right of title to land. He said if there were no Christian nations, then the land would open, was open for Christian occupation. And he said if there were no Christian people in this land, then they did not have a right of title to land. They had only the right of occupancy. Hmm. 1493, one year later, took over the whole Western Hemisphere. One big statement. All of a sudden, we were gone and they were there. Of course, we didn't know that. But that was the underlying move. That's how we lost land. Uh, in 1823, a very famous case called uh, Johnson versus McIntosh, the Supreme Court. A couple of white guys are arguing over Indian land. Judge Marshall says to them, well, he says, you got this all wrong, you know. Indians don't have title. And so he went back to 1796 and he said the Cabots from England were given the right and title to come and occupy land. The King of England said, well, if the Pope can do it, so can I. And he did. Well, you know, he split away from the uh, Roman Catholic Church that was made their own Bible. King James Version. And we were caught in the middle. We were caught in this, this event. And he said that this is how we've taken land. And we're not going to change now. 1783 or 1823. So 1823, the doctrine of discovery goes into U.S. Supreme Court law. 1955, Tihatan Indians were made a land claim and they lost. And in the Supreme Court statement, just, you could look it up. And what Yogi Berra says, you could look it up. Tihatan versus U.S. T E E dash H I T dash T O N. Tihatan versus U.S. Look it up, 1955. And read the racist language in there. And said, not only do we not have to compensate you for your land, we, we you know, we, we don't have to, he said, not only can we take your land, we don't have to compensate you, because you don't have title. That's 1955, U.S. Supreme Court. Well, gets on Indians in Canada. They brought a land claim, British Columbia, 1991. They lost on guess what? The doctrine of discovery, the law of nations. Canada, Canadian law, Australia, they're battling the doctrine of discovery. It's around the world. Well, last year, a little town of Cheryl over here brought this claim against the Oneidas. Said, you gotta pay taxes, and the Oneidas said, it's our land. Well, we, we won that land. Supreme Court says so. Well, went all the way to Supreme Court. The Supreme Court turned right around and says, no, you have to pay taxes. So it's a very, very 
uneven, unjust system that is prevailing today in this country. Very uneven for American Indians. It's unfair, unjust, but it's real. You know, when the Blackfeet Indians brought this uh, case against uh, the Department of Interior, demanded to know where did, what, $8 billion disappear to? Can you account for the $8 billion that you guys are entrusted to look after? No. The justice, the judge that was uh, adjudicating the case, was incensed by the uh, attitude of the Department of Interior. And they were, I mean, the, the heads of the Department of Interior were charged. And eventually, they removed the judge. They just removed him a couple of months ago. And they said, you're too biased. That's the court today. So as you know, the Onondaga claim is, is in the court, so we're wondering how they're gonna treat this case, which is really, literally, a slam dunk on law. The Onondaga case is against the state of New York who broke their own law. And they uh, have already sued that it be dismissed on latches and saying, oh, you guys are too late. Well, it worked for Cheryl. So who knows the injustice unless the American people speak up? There's an old story, you know, about the Nazi Germany when they said first they came for the Jews, finally they come for you. So that's the way it works. I don't have any advice or answers to, to that. I just alert you to the fact that that's what's occurring now. And um, it's not healthy. It's not good for a democratic nation. And how in the world can a leader of this country go around the world to talk about democracy when he can't give it back to the original people of this land? That's the case. Digging a deep hole over there. Digging a deep hole. It's going to be tough to get out of there. All about oil. Well, in the meetings that we've been having in um, Sweden, we had several big meetings last year, and uh, the consensus was with the leadership that oil is over. It's over. You're going to have to find other energy. Energy's the problem. You're going to need energy. You've got to find it. You've got to develop it. You've got to conserve. You've got to get ready. Do you take a guess on what they're paying for gasoline in Greenland? A gallon. Eight and a half dollars a gallon. They pay $6 in Europe. $6 again, they're paying that right now. I was telling my friend over there, Leonard Spahn, I said, Leonard, I said, one of those SUVs costs 100 bucks to fill it up. He looked at me, he says, see that little Toyota I got there? That costs 80 bucks to fill it up. They're paying it over there. We're squealing on $3. The rest of the world's paying six and more. I mean, you have to get a little reality here. If 
we're going to survive, we're going, we're going to have to 